This is a sermon that starts with a story about jam. You may know something about the jam experiment, an experiment that was originally designed by two scholars, Sheena Iyengar and Mark Lepper. Their simple idea was this. One day they set up a table just inside the entryway of a really upscale supermarket. And on the table, they put 24 different kinds of gourmet jams and jellies and preserves, all made by the same high-end company. The shoppers could sample the jam, and if they tried a sample, then they were given a coupon for a discount if they went to the shelves and bought a jar of jam. On another day, the same team set up at the same table in the same store with the same coupons for the same discount. But this time, they only had six jars of jam on the table, 75% fewer selections than in the first condition. And again, people could try the samples, and if they did, they got a coupon to go to the shelf and choose a jar of jam. Now, what do you think happened? Well, the first thing that happened was a lot more people gathered around the table with all 24 different varieties of jams and jellies. They stopped, they asked questions, they took the coupon. But in the end, what really happened was the people who had only six choices ended up buying more jam than the people who had seen all 24 possibilities. And not by just a little bit. The people with fewer choices were 10 times more likely to leave the store with a jar of jam in their shopping bag. If we had to give an account for what is distinctive about humans, about what defines being human, we could do a lot worse than this short statement. Humans are creatures who live under the condition of having to make conscious choices. Now, of course, it's possible that other higher creatures may live under similar conditions. We, we just can't know with certainty. What we do know, because we cannot escape it, is that the human condition is the inescapable requirement to navigate our course in life across a landscape of decisions. Virtually every other creature in the created order simply and reflexively does what is necessary to survive. But we, we choose. And more than that, we must choose. It's both our privilege and our prison. There's tremendous power in that idea. It's the beginning of an explanation for why these very large cortexes of ours enabled us to become such a dramatically dominant species. But it also lies at the foundation of the cultures we create and the things that we associate with honor and success and wealth. We believe that freedom can basically be understood as the range of choices available to us. Perhaps the single most influential statement of that thesis in English is a book that's now 40 years old by the Nobel laureate economist Milton Friedman and his wife and partner Rose. It was published under the unambiguous title, Free to Choose. So if that's true, if freedom means a limitless range of choices, then the reverse must be true as well. Our culture teaches us that to have no choice is the same thing as having no freedom. In fact, so far as the culture around us is concerned, one way of defining poverty is as the fundamental absence of any possibility to choose. So now think for a moment about what it means not to choose, but to be chosen. The people around Jesus were inheritors of the covenant between Abraham and God. They had survived the destruction of Solomon's temple and the exile to Babylon. They had rebuilt the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and had worshipped there for over 500 years. They lived under the condition of being the oppressed people in a country occupied by a foreign power. Through victory and defeat, through exile and occupation, they held themselves together by a certainty that they had been chosen, 
chosen by God for a particular purpose, a particular destiny in salvation history. But being chosen meant a very different understanding of freedom. Because being chosen meant being part of a covenant. And think about this, the code of that covenant, the commandments and the mitzvah, that was all a list of limitations on freedom. The choices that you were not allowed to make, things you were not allowed to do, the thou shalt nots of the Bible. Seen from the perspective of our culture, that seems like a paradox. Who would want to be chosen if being chosen means less freedom, not more? Doesn't our well-being, our fulfillment, depend on having the greatest possible choice? We are two weeks away from our great feast of the church, the Pentecost Sunday. It's going to be the most magnificent mess ever in the cathedral. Something like five or six people are going to be baptized. We may have some people being confirmed. Everyone who's there is going to be given the chance to renew their baptismal vows. And when we speak of all of that, we often do so in the sense of inviting people to make a decision, a choice, that they want to be part of the covenant community, part of the body of Christ. That's especially true of confirmation. Confirmation is the right in which we express a mature commitment to Christ. That's what it says in the catechism in the back of our prayer book. But notice, it doesn't say anything there about making a choice. That's because whether you like it or not, and you may not, this all starts with Christ choosing you. This all starts with something that is out of your control and not subject to your consent. You have been chosen, chosen to be a disciple. It wasn't just those 12 stubborn, somewhat dull men that Jesus had in mind when he said that. It wasn't just the people that had followed him around and showed up in his crowds or supported his ministry. Jesus is talking about you and me. Yes, us. You've been chosen. He's talking about all of us. In fact, he's talking about everyone. Everyone with ears to hear. As people shaped by Western culture in the early 21st century, that makes us feel a little uncomfortable, maybe even a little constrained, because to be chosen means to be limited. It means having fewer choices. But here's where we get back to the jam story. It turns out that having limitless choices isn't really the greatest freedom. It's more like having no freedom at all. The people who were better off, at least if you think about choosing to have a jar of jam and leaving the store with it versus not being able to choose one, well, those people were the ones whose choices had already been limited. We are Christian people. We hold as an article of faith that God is love. Two words for the same idea. Love has chosen us. Love has chosen us to be possessed, to be owned, to be in covenant. A covenant with the way of love. That's not just a marketing slogan. It's a way of life. And if we, for our part, choose to accept being chosen by love, then yes, we give up some things but we gain a great deal more. But understand this, what it means to accept being chosen means choosing to be bound by the terms of our covenant with Christ. The Roman Catholic author and professor Fritz Bauerschmidt, in his brilliant little book, The Love That Is God, puts it this way. Jesus makes love an imperative, not simply love of God, but love of other human beings. You cannot be friends with God. You cannot share the life of the risen Jesus if you do not love other people. To claim to love God without engaging in the difficult task of loving those whom I encounter in my everyday life is to engage in a deadly, deceptive fantasy. I am lying to others and to myself. I might think it is easier to love God, 
whom I imagine vaguely as something somewhere that is everything good and lovable, than it is to love my grimy and annoying neighbor, who is so insistently there in my face, making demands. But that is because the God I claim to love is a fantasy of my own creation, not the grimy and annoying God who is there on the cross making demands. I cannot love that God without loving my neighbor, because that God has become my neighbor. When we accept the terms of the covenant with the love who has chosen us, we give up some things. We give up being ruled by the expectations and terms of this world and this culture. We give up our certainty that we are all that is and that we know everything worth knowing. We give up the freedom of living without having to check ourselves in the moral mirror from time to time. The false freedom of living without responsibility toward others. But what we gain is becoming part of the only force with the power to change the world for the good, which is love. We become a part of, we become a force for the victory of reconciliation over division, the triumph of hope over despair, the conquest of life over death. We have been chosen, my sisters and brothers. That is a high and holy privilege. It remains now for us to take counsel together to find our answer to the central question. What does the love who has chosen us hope to see us do? What is the loving purpose to which we have been called? Where is God's love most needed right here among us and in the neighbors around us? What love are we being called to be and to show in the world? Give us discerning hearts, God of love, that in making the choices that confront us each day, we may always choose the path of love that both reflects and leads to you for your love's sake. Amen. Amen.